Now the Spirit of God is in here right now. He is so willing to get some things over to you. But he is really, really more aggressive than we think. He's very aggressive about truth. And what happens is, is we think he's kind of shy and he backs off when people reject him or whatever, whatever, if there's rebellion, these kind of things, we, we misunderstand God. God does not make us do anything. He doesn't make us do anything. And it is the, the biggest deception that I found growing up in the churches that denied the power of God but had a form of godliness. And that was is that, that God will do whatever he wants to do. And if he wants to do something, he'll do it. If he doesn't, then fine. And, you know, he'll have his way. And he doesn't have his way. Just look at the mess we're in. God is not in control. If God was in control, all the fruit of the Spirit would be operating and people would be able to walk up their stairs to their airplane without falling three times. Fall three times. The steps of, of, of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. So if you're tripping against gravity, do you get it? The steps of a, a righteous man are ordered from the Lord. You have to see these are all signs. Yes, amen. So God doesn't always have his way. If he did, you would experience shalom. You'd experience peace all the time because you'd be living with him, in him. Everything you do would be in synchronization with heaven. So... If God had his way, we wouldn't have to pray. We wouldn't have to give. We wouldn't have to do certain things. We wouldn't have to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. We wouldn't have to preach good news because we'd be living it. So obviously God is not in control. So when people say that, it's a religious phrase that God is in control. He's not in control. Jesus said there were two things going on. There's a thief, and the thief kills, steals, and destroys. Yes, okay, but he said, I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. He didn't just say life, but life more abundantly. So he, he just drew a line, and he caused division. He caused discernment. He caused there to be polarity. He, there was, now there's a decision because you have two choices. But Jesus did this to show what, that he represented a good God, a good father who sent him. And when he sent him, he went around doing good and healing everyone that was oppressed of the devil, Acts 10.38, because God was with him. Well, of course God was with him. He was God. But he drew the line and he, he set, he really set the bar right there. And if everyone would honestly take their life and measure it up to this test, either it's, either it's God or it's the enemy. The enemy is a thief. The enemy is a liar. God is truth. God is good. God loves. Satan hates. Okay, so your enemy hates you. And there is no salvation for your enemy. Satan does, does not have a chance to be redeemed and either do any of the evil spirits. So there wouldn't be a teaching on warrior justice if justice was not needed, if everything was righteous already. The Hebrew word for justice is the same word for righteousness, zedek. It's the same. 
So God is righteous, thus he is just. If there's a discrepancy between what you're experiencing on this earth and what God has said, it's because of the enemy in a broken world, right? I'm, I'm walking you in very slowly. I'm still excited about what just happened here. I feel the power of God that children are going to take the helm and we're going to have a, a generation that is going to rise up and be, be, be strong in the Lord, you know? But the problem, the problem, the problem that I'm encountering with myself and I graduated finally, and this is the problem. If you do not own your situation in the sense of this, if you do not honestly say, you know what? I, I am having trouble in this area. There's, there's a problem here. My, there's, there's a handoff that came from my family line that, that I'm seeing a trend here no matter what. Why is it that no one in my family could complete college? And why did the devil fight me to finish college? Well, do you ever think that it might be the same devil that fought the rest of my family? Same with everybody in my family getting certain things, certain diseases, certain weaknesses in the pancreas or in the colon. And then the doctor's like, well, do you have any history of this? It's like, well, it's none of your business. <laughs> because what, what happens is, is there's, there's a devil, there's a demon that's assigned to enforce a curse. Yep. Right. And then that, that demon is waiting for some sort of an agreement. And if you're not careful, because you've got to remember that doctors are just practicing. They're not really always sure. They're very good at what they do, but you have to understand that they don't know everything. They're, everybody's different. You might have this, you might have this, we're going to find out. But then we'll try this. It's like, well, wait a minute, you might and we try. And I just had this vision of a, of a guinea pig. All of a sudden, like, you're part of, like, some study or something, you know. Yeah. But, you know, no, I'll study my Bible at home, and I'll study for my courses, and I'll study for all this. But, you know, when it comes to my body, yep. you ain't studying. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. Amen. You study at home, and when you, you right. get it right, you come talk to me. When you, in other words, it's all discovery. So I find doctors that will talk to me and say, you know what? This is what's going on. This is what I want to do. And then I say, well, is there anything that I can do on my own? Is there anything natural? Is there anything I could do with my diet? Is there anything that, that what, why does this happen? Is it something genetic? Because then I can take care of it spiritually. It, it's going to be a miracle to go into my my genes and change them. It's going to have to be a creative miracle to change your genes. Even though there's certain individuals that are doing it right now, you just don't know it. <laughs> but it's, it's going to take a miracle to change something that Satan has somehow got into your genes. Okay, because that's, that is the code in, in there. It's going to take a miracle. But what can I do if I'm predisposed? Because God would have to do a creative miracle. Now, there might not be a devil present. It might be, have been manipulated and, and caused a, 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 uh, a mistake in the code which was transferred down. That's why it says that curses go to the third and fourth generation and why yes. blessings go. It, it's, all, it's in the blood. It's in the code. Life is in the blood, it says in the Bible. 
That's why Jesus, his blood is so important because he was not tainted in his genetics. Noah, it says, was perfect in his genetics, in his, in his generations. They only ate people that had not been interbred. It says that right in the Bible. There was no anybody else going to be on the ark. Okay, so getting back to the thief, if God says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, you need to grow up if you're not there yet and just own it and just say, you know what? I'm being stolen from. That's right. I'm being lied to. That's right. And just label it. That's the enemy. Yes, amen. Still kill and destroy. So if something is is trying to kill you or someone or something is trying to steal from you or somebody's trying to destroy you, then Jesus said it's the thief. That's right. Right? right. Period. It wasn't like a big word study. (laughs) He just said it, right? Okay, so... The same thing with him. I've come to give give you life and life more abundantly. Okay, if that's the case, then God is not making you sick because Jesus only did what the Father sent him to do. He went around doing good and healing. Healing. Did I mention healing? He healed everyone that was oppressed of who? Okay, this is Acts 10.38. It's already there. Okay, so God didn't send Jesus to make people sick because... He was healing people and he was working against his father if he was doing that. And God wouldn't make somebody sick so that Jesus could heal them. So God is not trying to teach you something through sickness. Sorry, usually it takes a week in college to get this out, but I have five minutes per thing I'm talking about here, so I'm going right there for the jugular, for everything. I want to destroy the works of the devil because Jesus already did. But it's up here. It's up here. Your immune system, your immune system was given to you by God to heal your body and to protect you. But your body in a fallen state does not always have everything it needs to operate the way it was made originally. So your body always wants to heal itself. And my doctor says, we're just helping God. We're just helping God heal. The body wants to heal, we're just helping it. If we need to cut something out, we do. If we need to give you something to help you in that path, then we do. But honestly, life is really in the blood and life is in the fruit of the vine. It's in the the substance of this earth because we came from the earth. So we have to eat things that are carbon-based and and water-based. And there's all these things that our body needs because that's how God, he took it out of the earth and made us. So everything we need for our body is down here. (coughs) Sorry, boy, that was loud. (laughs) Happy, happy. So the foundation of deliverance is really God's justice. Why? Because it was never meant that we would need deliverance. So if you need delivered, what it is is something has infiltrated either your body, your soul, or your spirit and is dictating your life. It's, it's influencing you to live way below. So you could change your diet and miracles happen and God didn't even breathe on you. Why? Because the body is earth-based and it is, it is a subject to these laws in this realm and it needs certain nutrients from the ground. So that's why Jesus, he could raise a girl from the dead, but he said, give her something to eat immediately because if not, she would die again. Because her body experienced a miracle, but then it needed something in this realm to sustain it and start to build itself up again because she had been dead. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you. <laughs> but you, you come back to life, I mean, your body's like, okay, 
I need a happy meal or something here <laughs> right away. Like, right, like, because that's, that's your body. Needs, it needs that. Okay, your soul, it needs input. It needs data. It needs, it needs experience. It needs to be able to touch things, feel things, uh, uh, have interaction. So it's your mind, your will, and your emotions, and you need to be able to interact. And so you, 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 you seek understanding, you seek experience, you, you develop skills, you, you, need, you need to experience these things. If those things are taken away, then a person starts to suffer. So they need relationships, they need interaction, they need to be taught, they need to experience and, and get their brain, their organic brain, um, and it's attached to your emotions. And, and there's all kinds of things that you need. And then there's your spirit, which is the eternal part of you, but it, it's, it's in a fallen state. So you have to be born again of the spirit in order to have that come alive. So you're dead to sin until you come alive. And the spirit is is able to just come in and mesh with your spirit because it's the same kind of substance. It's spiritual. So God's a spirit. Those who worship him, worship him in spirit and truth. But yet you saw us plucking strings and hitting keys and blowing into things and creating sound. But what's behind that is spiritual. There's a spiritual substance that comes with it. It's the same with the soul. It's very powerful, but it's not permanent. Soulish things are not permanent. So it surprised me that, but it didn't surprise me, that what happened with, with the churches, when, when, when the tests come, you really find out what, what you're really ministering to in a person, in, in a congregation, and in people that you minister to, the permanent part of you is, is the spirit, and it's eternal. And when you minister to that part of you, then that ignites you to be in, in the spirit, which Paul talks about, and we're going to talk about this weekend in Romans 8. But if you minister to the soul, all you're doing is, is, is uh, causing people to feel things like peace and comfort and, you know, and yet, if I hug you, you're going to need another hug so, from somebody. It's not going to be, it's, when you eat, you need to eat again. Right. When you see your family member, that you want to see them again. Um, when you, you get a degree, you, you want, you want it to go even further, or you want to learn something else. You encounter something, and you think, well, I, I climbed Mount Rainier, now I want to climb Mount Everest, which is twice as high. Or, you know, et cetera. You know, just like that. Because it's a soulish thing. It, it's never really satisfied. Because you get hungry again. You want to learn more. There's more to learn. Um, you get tired of some people because they're, they're freaky. They start freaking out on you. And you, you just need new friends. And then, you know, it's like everything changes, right? In, those, in this realm. But there's eternal part of you does not. So what I found was, I, I suspected for a couple of years that there, that there was really a ministry towards the soul in the churches yep. and not the spirit. And I would talk about this before all this happened. And the Lord kept telling me to talk about it. I'm like, I'll do that. But what, where are we going? And then he showed me where we were going, and I, I tried to warn people, this is what God's will is, but I, I also see that if we don't pray, if we don't repent, that we're going to be put into these situations that are pretty tight and hard, and it's because there's a remnant that's hidden within the hole, and sometimes God chooses to put us into the desert to see what's in us, and that's what is in the Bible, it says that, that he, he, he wanted to see what was in them. And obviously they failed the test and, the, and they all fell dead. And you know, even in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira fell dead. Jesus couldn't do many miracles in his own hometown. We see these failures. We see the, the guy in Corinthians who was told, Paul said, turn that guy over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. 
You know, this is like, you know, we're going to have baptisms, baby dedication, and then we're going to turn Charlie over to the devil. <laughs> it was just part of the, it was part of the service. It, it, I know, and we laugh about it, but, the, you know, it's like at what point does somebody stand up and say, you know what, I think, we, I think we're off. In other words, like, when does it happen? See, it doesn't happen because people that speak for God, men and women in the past, they weren't heroes when they were alive. They were persecuted by the church. Or Robert's got his tent, not because he likes tents. He was kicked out of the church because he said that God was good. He said that God was a good God, and they kicked him out. He goes, you're misleading the people by telling them. I'm serious. Look it up. You're misleading the people by telling them that God is a good God. It's pretty clear he isn't. So he's intense. So people were not heroes when they were alive. They wanted to kill every prophet. They killed all the apostles. Yeah. Come on, let's be honest. They, were all, they spent a lot of time in jail. Yeah. And at what point do we just stand up and say, you know what, we're off? So what we reaped in the last couple of years was, the, was exactly what was sown. We sowed into people's souls as ministers, most of us. A lot of us did. I didn't. But, but many, many people were just trying to take care of people and make them feel comfortable and, and give them an experience in church. But see, it wasn't enough to get us through what we just went through. And, and, the, and, and there's always a group of people in every generation, if you study, the church always, always has the remnant. Amen. And each generation has someone who, who carries a torch over to the next generation. And, and then those people... They're like on fire for God and they speak and then everybody goes toward them and then somehow man gets involved with it and makes it a brick and mortar thing. And then before you know it, you're being controlled. I just summed up America, but I'm talking about the church. A shepherd is just supposed to take you to still waters and green pastures and protect you and serve you serve and protect. That's what's on every police car. That's what the government's role is. We hired people to serve and protect us. Not to tell us what we can believe or what we can carry and not carry. Now listen to me. It's never been about what everybody makes it about. This is to cause division. Everything that you are encountering is the enemy coming in to steal, kill, and destroy. It has nothing to do with life. Listen, if you got to give away $100 gift cards and free fries to go get something that they say you need, well, Talk about it. Talk about it. free fries? Right, come on. You've got to be kidding me. No, think about it. If, 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 if you got a solution, skip the fries. Jesus skipped the fries. He came and he gave life. He, he had solutions, but he said, here is how it works. My father has sent me, and the words that I speak are not mine, they're his. The works that I do are not mine. I do nothing on my own. He said, the spirit who is coming after me, he will not speak on his own. He says that he will only do what the father tells him to say. So right now, if what I'm saying is from the Father, then, then it's the Holy Spirit. But if I'm saying something that's not from the Father, the Holy Spirit would not speak that through me. It's good. It's good. If, I mean, if you're going to bring the Holy Spirit into it and let the Spirit minister through you, don't you think that the Spirit's going to say what the Father's saying? Yes. Okay, you get it? Well, what is the Father saying? Truth. Jesus said that. He's, gonna, he's a spirit of truth. He's going to lead you in all truth. He's going to speak those things and remind you of what I said. And he's going to tell you about the future. So the spirit will preempt you about what's coming. But it's still your choice. You can, you can not listen to it. So it's interesting how Jesus said you'll know, you'll know them by their fruit. Okay, so 
everybody was trying to figure out what God's will was for the month of November. Okay? But see, the fruit of it, now even those who didn't agree are now like, oh my God. Why? Because the fruit, which, which we already knew. But it was a small amount of voices where things were allowed to happen that should have never happened. And you know what? I put up with it all my life. If you can't win honestly, then cheat. That's what people think. If I can't win truthfully, then I cheat to win. If I can't win right, then I'll steal. I'll kill. I'll start a war. Kind of draw the attention away from what's going on. Just start a war somewhere. Moving on. When, when are you all going to read history and figure out there's a whole plan that repeats itself every generation? Have you not noticed what happens? It's not if another thing's going to happen, it's when. Because they have to control you. See, the Holy Spirit wants to control you. The only reason that we're here is because a group of people said, you know what, we don't want to be under the rule of England. We don't want to be told what we believe. We don't want to be told what we see and hear. And now look what's happening. We're being told what we're supposed to believe. We're being told what we see, which is not what we see. (laughs) Nothing here. Just keep moving. Keep walking. So you have to step out of the soul realm and not allow that to be the, the predominant guidance. It has to be the spiritual thing. Okay, so the foundation of deliverance is God's justice because what happens is, is that he has to pull his sword of truth out and he has to insert it into your life and he has to show you what the true is. But it's shocking if you've been fed soulish things all your life and you've developed a framework of how you live and then all of a sudden your comfort is more important to you than your character. And then what happens is you start giving up things for your comfort and then you can't understand how all of this could be happening. But see, you are sold out very slowly by getting you intoxicated by the world and by everything that you see and touch and by power, by by the seduction of pursuing wealth and, and having the next thing, whatever it is. And it's never gonna stay more than a few months because they're gonna keep you driven to get the next best thing instead of just giving you the thing that they know they have that can help right now. They want you to buy the six computers in between. When I I have friends that, what we have now 15 years ago, he was working on what we we had, had just years ago. He was working on that 15, 20 years ago. And I know what's coming because he told me that too. He told me what he was working on and what hard drives will look like and what, what screens will look like. They won't be screens. They'll be discs that project straight up. And I'll be able to preach all over the world if you have that disc. I can stand on this disc and they can have their disc in Dubai and I can stand right in the middle of their church right now live and they will not be able to tell that it's a projection. So I'm waiting for that. I'm waiting for that to come because then I can, I can just preach everywhere and then go to my hotel room. No fuel. No in-flight beverage or meal, anything, nothing. 
Well, don't you think that if this is the way man is in his intellect and in his soul, how, how much more a God who is spirit, who sent the Holy Spirit to us to not only be with us, but be in us. And then also, oh, that's not good. That's all the devil's got. He's messing with my simulator. <laughs> messing with my simulator. If the Spirit of God is also wanting to work through you, not just live in you, then that becomes spiritual activity because the Spirit is Spirit. And, he, and, and Jesus said it's Spirit to Spirit, soul to soul. And he said that the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So he says all these things to show that there's different parts of us. So what happens is, is this was all a scheme to get people intoxicated in their soul over themselves, occupied, and then bam. But see, the whole time this thing has been working, it was working three and four presidents ago. The same agenda. They all were friends. They're all laughing right now as I'm talking. Where you all been? You look at me like it's all new. <laughs> this is the agenda of the Antichrist spirit. Okay, so what you need to know is the truth. The truth is that the Antichrist, according to Paul, if you want to bring the Bible and Paul into it, he said that the son of perdition, the evil one, the Antichrist, he cannot come forward until the, the, uh, him who is, is holding him back is removed. And you know who that is. I go, no, Paul, we don't. So, he assumed that we understood, the Thessalonians knew that it was the church and the Holy Spirit within. When the Spirit's removed, chaos will happen within 30 seconds. Right. Lawlessness will happen. I'm not talking like what we see now in Portland. Right. I'm talking about invasion. Right. Where my, my police friends they pray that they go in the rapture. If, there, if, there's, if there's a snatching away, they want to be in it because as soon as the spirit is removed, lawlessness will happen. Mm -hmm. And you do not want to be in a cruiser with a badge. No, no. amen. Because there will be no, there will be no restraint. No. See, the law restrains you. Yeah. But the, the law of love says that you would not do these things and you wouldn't need a police officer or a military because you would walk in love. And that's why Jesus said, you can fulfill the whole law with these two things, which is actually three things. He said, he said love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So that's three. Love yourself, love your neighbor as yourself, and love God. If you do this, you fulfill all the law. Well, they had, they had over 600 laws when, when God gave them 10. Yeah, 613 or whatever it is, how many tassels are on the tallit. So God gave them 10 and they turned it into over 600. Okay, but Jesus said, if you love God with all your heart and you love your neighbor as yourself, you fulfill all the law. How, how is that? Well, because you're not going to do something to your neighbor that you would do yourself. You, you would only do what you would do it to others as you would want done unto you. And if you love God, you're not going to be rebellious and disobey him and live a, a corrupt life because God loves you first. He loves you more. So when he loves you first and he loves you more, then you love yourself and then you love your neighbor because he forgave you and you got to forgive them. So he sets he sets the domino effect. He sets it into action by loving you more. You can never pay him back. And so you forgive because you've been forgiven. But see, the emotional part of it is where we suffer because that is where it starts to wear on people. 
and it affects your body because your soul is attached chemically and electrically to your body. Your soul, your emotions affect your body. Your thoughts affect your body. Okay? All right, so the foundation of deliverance, like if, if something has moved in, then justice has to be served, righteousness has to be introduced in order to expose the enemy first and then expel him. Yes. But, so if you didn't have God's justice or righteousness, you would never know that you've been infiltrated or deceived or living below your privileges. You would not know because God has to introduce himself into your life and talk to you and show you through experience. You have to encounter it and, and, and encounter God's love. To love, you have to encounter God's love. You can't do something you haven't encountered. You can't go to work and operate something that you don't have any knowledge of. You, even if you wanted to, you, you just, what would you do first? Not, I mean, you know, I would stay away from the red buttons. I wouldn't push those. And I wouldn't, and they say, don't cut the red wire. You know, if you're going to disarm something, don't, don't cut the red wire. You know, think, you know what I'm saying? I'm joking, but see, you don't really, like, you go into an environment that you're not really familiar with. You want to learn, but you, you need somebody to teach you. And then you need, you also need to encounter it. So the best way, the best way to learn something is to yoke yourself with someone that already does it. That is why Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. He said that because he, he, said, he said, my burden is, in other words, you're yoked with him as two oxen. And he's going to carry the load. It's going it's to be light. He explains that all. He said, he said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Learn of me. In other words, that's what they did. They always took one old oxen and they put a new one with the old one, and even though that young one would want to pull and do his own thing, it was yoked to the big one. And the big one just sat there like, you'll learn. Just relax. I got this. And they're like working, you know. It's just like a puppy. And then the older dog's like, dude. If you want a snack, just look cute. You don't have to like, you don't have to, Destroy the couch, you know. No, no, you get what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's mentoring. You learn from someone who's doing it. You just watch and you learn it. And before you know it, you're doing it. That's what Jesus said as the way we do things. But if I just minister to one part of you, then that's the only thing that develops. So then you have a bunch of, of carnal Christians. Paul called the Corinthians who everybody thinks they're spiritual because they're being used in a gift, but he called them carnal. He said, I wish I could address you as mature, spirit-led people, but he said, you are mere babes, you're carnal. You're on milk and you should be on meat by now. He said, I wish, he said this in chapter three of 1 Corinthians, after he talks about how the spirit reveals the deep mysteries of God and that we have the mind of Christ. I'm talking about the deep things of God, he does in verse 10. Then if you read the whole way to the end, he says, but we have the mind of Christ. And he goes, I, he goes right into chapter three, he goes, I wish I could address you as spiritual. See, what he did was he, he inserted the sword of the spirit into their carnal, carnal life, into, and their soul could not judge that sword. Because the soul is not trained to operate in the spirit. The soul has to be trained to yield to the spirit. Yes, amen. So all your knowledge, all your emotions, everything about you has to stay in check so that you experience the heightened spirituality of, of, a, of an encounter or a life. And you, it's supposed to add to your encounter spiritually. It's not supposed to guide you. But if you look at Christians, they make mistakes all the time because they're being led by their soul thinking that it's God. 
But it's because that voice is loud because that's what you fed. You have developed your soul. And that's where demons come in. Demons come in to talk to your soul and make you feel things and think things. And it's not the Spirit of God. The Spirit is a spirit. He's going to talk to you in your spirit, in your heart. That is a still small voice. Very seldom is it loud. Very seldom does he make you do anything. You have to be transformed, Paul says in Romans 12, by the renewing of your mind. So your mind needs to be renewed. It's not saved. Your spirit's saved. Okay, so the, the foundation of your deliverance is warrior justice. I want to go through this with what happened. The Lord has, had asked me to write this, and then I'm going to have you shut your books, and I'm going to teach you something new tonight that I've never taught before in this way. So I'm going to go through this because David is what the Lord asked me to use as, as the, the, the story about warrior justice, about what is it when you encounter God and you experience the spirit and you experience the other realm, you experience the kingdom of God, the powers of the coming age, all the things that happen when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, when you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you encounter the eternal realm and that realm does not have the limitations that we have down here. So immediately, it's, it's heightened for a while when you become a Christian, but then after a while, it becomes very frustrating because your spirit's alive, but your body and your mind are not. And they fight the new so-called way of life because they, are, they don't understand spiritual things. Your body and your mind do not understand spiritual things. And unless you train a bit, you have to renew your mind. By the word of God, it says, Paul said that in Romans chapter 12. So David therefore departed thence. This is in 1 Samuel 22, 1 and page 13 of the King James Version. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard of it, they went down to him. And so the Spirit of the Lord led me to do some word studies, which I did extensively. I'm not going to cover all that here. But you'll, by me talking to you, you will get what I gathered over hours and hours of looking over different Hebrew words in the Old Testament to figure out what the Spirit was hiding that he wants to reveal in this day. Because everything in the Old Testament is types and shadows, the Bible says, of things to come. So the Old Testament is given to us as a prophetic announcement of what is going to happen in the New Testament. So we see the fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures. In the New Testament, we see that fulfillment. And every word counts. Even the so-called mistakes in the Bible count. And it's interesting because, you know, Hebrew, maybe I'll get into this in greater detail tomorrow, but it's interesting in the, in the Hebrew, you don't have numbers. The letters, each letter, there's 22, not 26. There's no vowels. So you have 22 letters, no vowels. They added those little hash marks on the letters later because it was, uh, the, the biblical Hebrew is really dead. No one really speaks that language <coughs> As a, as a major language anymore, what it developed into was a street language, which is called Aramaic. So in Daniel, it started to happen. In Daniel, if you look in the original manuscripts, there's a place, um, I believe it's in chapter one, at the end of chapter one or into two, for just until like chapter three, it actually switches to Aramaic. Daniel starts writing in Aramaic instead of Hebrew, which really looks the same, but it's not. It's very much more colorful and that is how in the New Testament, and you have uh, translations like the Passion Translation, which is taken from the Aramaic, which was the, the, the language of that day that Jesus spoke. You know, you, you, you have to understand there's street language that's more colorful. And so there's some words that you couldn't say, but you could say it in Aramaic. And there's some things that aren't translated 
in the color that they were, because English is actually one of the worst languages to translate into. Okay, so you have to, to tell you the truth, my professors, and blame them, but they told me that the most accurate translation, besides the fact that the NSAB is, you know, word for word, but the actual flavor of Greek is the Amplified. So it ends up the Bible gets really bigger because it becomes more wordy because it needs to be wordy in order to take what's being said there. Like why did Paul, when he had seven different words that mean the same thing on the surface in English, why did he pick the word he chose? Because there were, there were several words that you could use that you would just see it as apple. But the word in Greek is a red apple with a dark spot on the left side. It's more descriptive at times. So anyway, God wants to get certain things across to you. So, so in the Old Testament, it talks about the size of the laver and it gives the cubits around the diameter. And it's Hebrew letters, of course. So you have to know like, okay, right there, that, that word there, it's a word, but it's also a, you add up the, the letters and it's, a, it's the 30 cubits. But when you add up the specifications that are listed there, it doesn't turn out to be pi. In other words, the pi is 3.14, you know, 6, 7, whatever, the whole way out. That causes, that's the formula that causes the curve. It, so, like, when you add the specifications up, it does not equal pi. Which would not make it a, the, a cor correct in what's listed there. But the word there, when you take all those letters to add it up, it's misspelled, and there's an extra letter there, but when you add that into it, a mistake, it adds up to pi. It adds up to the correct circumference, the length of it, to equal the curve to make it 3.14 the whole way around, whereas if there wasn't that extra letter there, it, it's wrong. So it appears that the scripture, that somebody slipped and made a mistake. But that wasn't a mistake. The word is intentionally misspelled so that the mathematical formula works. Did everybody follow that? Yes. Please don't let me repeat that again. <laughs> I'm exhausted. I didn't come to teach you science here. But what I'm trying to show you is, is that scripture is given to us for teaching us doctrine, but it also is prophetic. It's, everything was done to fulfill something that hasn't even happened yet, but it all falls into it. Okay, so Adalim, the cave of Adalim, the word for Adalim is God of justice. So David was hiding in the cave of God's justice. And he was hiding from being killed. Right? So Saul is out doing his thing because the whole, the whole thing was needed a recall on the vote. <laughs> so David's anointed for 17 years by Samuel. 17 years he was anointed king. He's hiding in a cave, the cave of justice, cave of Adalim. And it says that the people, it says that the people came to him, 400, who agreed to join him, and he formed his government in a cave called God's justice. 400 fighting men. Does everybody follow me? That's how God gave me this whole manual you're holding is off of what I just told you. And I just built it from there, praying in tongues and writing for weeks until it was done. And it's the best work I've ever done. But next week I'll have something even better, so don't, <laughs> don't build a memorial to it. 
But this is what I want to tell you, is that this is how God operates. He inserts himself in, in a cave, in a trailer home. He doesn't go to the mansion. See, everything, there's meaning hidden in your name. So when God shows up, every time God shows up, this is what I encounter, recompense. Okay, I encounter recompense. Why? Because I've learned the personality of my God. If God shows up, he's right and I'm wrong. And if I've been wronged, recompense is coming. Which is happening to me all the time. It's happening to you all the time. You're always being wronged. Because it's wrong down here. But when God inserts himself into your cave that you're hiding in, he's the God of justice, Adalam. He, he provides for you the group of people that you need to be around. And from those 400, when Saul went out to battle, they killed him right after this. And he became king. David became king. But it started in a cave. And it, if you read what the qualifications were of those people, do, do you, know, you know where I'm going? 1 Samuel 22, 1 and 2. Let's see if you all qualify for the new government. David therefore departed hence and escaped to the cave of Adom. And when his brother and his fathers heard of it, they went down hither thither, we don't even say that anymore, and everyone that was in distress, okay, there's your first qualification, Any that, everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto David, and became a captain, and he became captain over them, and there was with him about 400 men. This is how David's, God chose to start David's government. Busted, disgusted, and disappointed. Busted, disgusted, and disappointed. And this is what I've learned about God from reading his word. And the spirit of God is always right there to coach and mentor me, just like he does you. Is I've learned that when he shows up, he shows up as the end of the matter. He, he actually shows up at the, as though it's the end of it and it hasn't even started. He, he's, he, he's, he talks about things as though it's done and it hasn't started yet. He calls those things that are not as though they were. So when God shows up and visits me, like he's doing right now, he's visiting me right now. And it's better than a free fry. When he visits me, it's recompense. I know it. Every single time he visits me by his spirit, it's recompense. Why? Because I know where he's going. He didn't show up to see how I was doing. He knows how I'm doing. He knows I'm about ready to backhand somebody. Because I'm done. I'm done with injustice. I'm done with the silencing of, of, of the voice of the people. Okay, I'm done with that, okay? Well, all I have to do is go to my cave. My cave where God, where God meets me, the God of justice. Why? Justice always brings recompense. Now think about it. If justice is served, what does that mean? It was ruled in your favor. Justice was served, right? That's what you say, justice was served. Why? That guy's going to jail and I'm not. Or whatever. So your deliverance, the foundation of your deliverance is God inserting himself into that which is his justice. Oh my gosh, the clocks here move so fast. <laughs> this cannot be right. It's 10 to 9. That was... Okay, I will, but you know... This, no, there's, this is really not, this is messed up. I know, there's no way. There is no way. 
Okay, so <laughs> demons, demons. So when you're talking about the title of this whole weekend, which is not even the manual you have, it's the next manual that you're getting this weekend. I just wanted to like make it look like I did something from that manual. <laughs> What, what you need to know is that there are three creatures, three entities, three types of creatures, three different echelons of powers. There are certain things that they do not want you to ever know or understand. One of them is the Nephilim. They do not want you to understand their mode of operation, their intentions. The hybrids, they don't want you to understand or know about their mode of operations. And familiar spirits, they do not want you to know certain things and understand their mode of operation. And so they pushed me too hard this week, so I'm going to tell everything. Okay, so you have... Real quickly, to give you the outline for the new manual that I'm calling it as though it was, but it's not, but it is, because it's going to appear just weeks from now. And, it, and it's, the, the book will be The Nephilim, The Hybrids, and Familiar Spirits, What They Don't Want You to Know. And they pushed me too far. They all just pushed me too far. They thought, May, you know, we'll just keep a little, pre see how far we can get. And they just, they, I've had it. Okay. The, the reason why is it's not just for me. What it is is it's the injustice of the people. See, every person that they want to kill is someone who would actually stand up as the voice of the people when the people were being oppressed. If you think about it, Robin Hood robbed from the, the, the rich and gave it to the poor. Right. And the people loved him. But see, that really was King David. King David was the anointed one. And he, was the, he represented the people. So they would sing, oh, Saul slayed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Well, that didn't go over well. <laughs> what happens is, is that if you start to get momentum to where you're actually doing more, I'll get that in a minute. <laughs> then all of a sudden, when you start to be used by God, then everybody around you, including leadership, will get jealous. Yes, I mean. And then what happens is, is a, you know, like, like, uh, like if we have trespassers coming into our airspace and we don't know where they came from and we don't have the technology and they have pictures of it, well, the government wouldn't want you to know that they can't protect you from something. So it doesn't exist. And they ridicule people that see things from the other realm because they can't do anything about it because they deal with it with flesh and blood right. and they can't deal with the other realm because right. they're not spiritual. But they have evidence because these things come through. You get it? So if something's coming in and it's not from China or Russia, it doesn't have anything on its tail that identifies it because it's round and has ugly little creatures in it. Well, then what do you do with that? Well, you ridicule anybody that sees anything like that. Why? Because we don't want the people to know that we can't do anything about it. Why? Because you lose control of the people. Yes. Yes. Like you're, because we would fire them. Yep. Right. Amen. No, think about it. Okay, you're to serve and protect. You're fired. Yeah. Is this too much for y'all? No. Okay, so David, King David, he was anointed of God. He was the one chosen. But there's some shenanigans going on with the voting. Right. So he sat for 17 years hiding. I know what lever I pulled. Is that enough? So this happened thousands of years ago. I mean, nothing new, right? Okay, so God's will was not done. Which is finishes my introduction now. God's will is not always done. But justice, when it comes, I see it 
Don't you see it when God comes and, and ministers to you? He, he visits you. You have something to happen. You get a bike or a, a violin. Yes. Well, then, oh, well, that's justice. Yes. You feel it. It's recompense. It's like, you know, wait, there is a God. There is a God in Israel. There is a God in Zion. There is, there is an almighty God whose arm is not too short that he cannot save. See, what happens is, is what you would have had to work for, you just got for free. Like that. Well, if I were you, I would run to the cave of justice. I would just run and wait and let God do his thing because it was already set and anointed. God already knew. Joshua and Caleb, they believed God and they did, they, they announced the good report. Two, only two people, a remnant. Well, after everybody else died, then they believed them. But it was too late. They're all dead. All right. So we've got we're going over this. I'm going to shut this because I'm going to do this very kindly with an attitude because I, 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 I'm very irritated. So I don't want I'm going to block the comments so no one can comment on these videos. I will not write anyone back. I will not explain anything. There are so many scriptures. Find them yourself. It's pretty, it's pretty clear. I don't got time for this. I don't got time. I don't got time for this. Girl, where's your shoes? Some of you know what I'm talking about. There's a video out. They were interviewing this lady. What happened? My apartment's on fire. I said, girl, where's your shoes? I don't got time for this. <laughs> anyway, look it up on YouTube. I don't got time for this. Okay. Anyway, there comes a point where this is the way it is. The scriptures lay it out. You have, you have a serpent who is not the devil. You have a a creature in the garden that was more subtle than all the others. You have an animal, the serpent, that was more cunning than all the others, which made his personality close enough for something to come in and possess it. Okay? Does everybody understand it? Do not write me. <laughs> you have to take this scripture literally. Okay, so when Nakash in Hebrew is talking to Eve, which is a man with a womb, womb man, mm -hmm. was not taken out of the ground, was taken out of man. If yeah. God wanted to make woman like he made man, he would have done it. He didn't. Okay, he took woman out of man. It was a man with a womb. This is the proper order. If he wanted to make them women, women like, like he made man, he would have just taken the dust and made them. But he did this because this is his way of doing things, period. He might not even discuss it with you. This is just the way it is, okay? But it's very important to understand demonology, believe it or not, because God has authority and order. The way he does things is not always explained. It just has to be accepted. Okay, so when Nakash, when that serpent spoke, which is the bright and shiny one, his name in Hebrew that you can look up in Isaiah and in Ezekiel, it's not Lucifer. It says, oh, Lucifer, thou hast fallen. If you look up the Hebrew word, Lucifer is not there in Hebrew. Hallel is there. The bright and shining one, the wise one, which is Nakash in his character. He was, the, it was a bright and shining a creature. Calls him a cherub, cherub, 
when you read Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. You need to do this. I don't have time for it. I've already taught on this stuff. I need to get on with the agenda. Okay, so you have, you have Eve. Well, somebody just kicked a can. It's only Jordan humidity. Yes. You have, you have a serpent, a creature, talking to Eve, not to Adam. I wonder what it would be like to stand before Adam. Because Adama in Hebrew changes eventually to Ish, common man. So the sons of Adama stopped at a certain point. And then you have Ish mentioned. And then you get to chapter 6, and it says that the sons of God the upper line, went into the daughters of men, right. Ish, not sons of, the sons of Adama right. went into Ish. Moving on, this is what the Bible, this is what is, what's there. So at a certain point, they were not allowed, the godly line was not allowed to come down. There were thousands, hundreds of thousands, they said at Noah's time there were millions of people on the earth. Because they were all having babies for hundreds of years. Get over it. They married their sisters. It's not like today. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> all right, so you have Eve eating of the fruit, giving it to her husband, and then you have God coming down, talking to them face to face in a fallen state. He couldn't kill them. They, they still lived for hundreds of years in a fallen state. Cain, he came to Cain and sat with him and coached him and says, don't you know if you do right, you'll be accepted? But you must master it. Sin desires to have you. It is crouching at the door. But you must master it. He tried to face to face in a fallen state outside the garden. That's how amazing man and woman was. It took hundreds of years for them to die. And God was still able to look at them face to face and talk to them in their sin. Are you following me? Okay. So God pronounces what appears to be curses but really what it is, is okay, you numbskulls, this is what you just done. You opened up hell. Right. You opened it up, and yeah. this is what's going to happen. He, did, he didn't like say, okay, I'm going to slap you for this. You just did this to yourself, and here's what you just did. Here's the result of what you just did. Come on now. The punishment was a result. It was there because they did what they did. He didn't have to do a thing. Come on now. Because of the fallen state, every single being, Adam, Eve, and the serpent, we're going to encounter things. Cain's marked. Okay, he's going to get beat up everywhere he goes. Right? It's a result of a decision they made. It is not God slapping them. God is a good God. The consequences were there if they chose to do that, but they never encountered because they didn't know evil, because their eyes were not open to it. Right. We were never supposed to know evil. We're never supposed to die. We're never supposed to encounter sin. We're never have to separate from God. We're never asking what his will is, ever. We're not, we're not supposed to live this way down here, wondering, if it's God's will or what's happening now. Why are people falling up the stairs? Yeah. <laughs> why, why, what is going on? The disease of the weak. Yeah, yeah come, right. on. come on. It's a fallen world. It's broken. People tell you what you believe. They tell you what you see, what you don't see. They tell you how you feel. Tell you where you can go and not go. 
Okay, this is a result of, of, a, of the creation in the image of God choosing to not be who they were. They already were. They chose not to be that, thinking that there was something that they were missing. They had everything. Okay, so moving on from, I want to talk about the Nephilim because the Nephilim, Nephal, Nephal in Hebrew means fallen. Aim is always means the plural. So you have cherub and you have cherubim. You have Nephilim, plural, meaning many, fallen ones, not fallen one. You have Yah, you have Elohi, which is God, singular. You have Elohim, which is what Moses uses through the whole Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Every time God is mentioned, it's used incorrectly. Instead of Elohim, he says Elohim, God's, plural. Instead of Panai, which is face, the word is constantly used, Panaim, plural. My faces shall look upon you with favor. Not face, my face. The word is the word we use for presence. My face says, shall go with you, Moses. We read it as presence. There is no word for presence. It's panaim, it's faces, plural. Elohim is plural used as a singular noun, which is incorrect. Is this too much? Okay, so why did Moses do this? Because he saw the truth, and he had to portray it with a word. Okay, so he says, God says to the serpent, your seed. So the devil has seed? Your seed. And the woman's seed, the woman doesn't have seed. Man has seed. Women have eggs. Okay? Yep, the woman's seed, her seed is going to crush the seed of the serpent. But he's going to bruise the heel. His seed, the serpent's seed, I didn't know the serpent had seed, but the serpent's going to bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. But he's going to crush it, just like Jesus did when he crushed him and made a show of him openly, destroyed him, destroyed him. Did I mention destroy? Yeah. He destroyed the works of the devil. That's what the Bible says, okay? So God tells that there's going to be a hybrid. There's going to be an attack of the serpent seed against the seed of the woman, the offspring. The offspring. So... Genesis 6 is not a big problem. You have hybrids. Angels don't have male or female parts. Jesus said, when you die, you won't marry because you'll be like the angels who are not given in marriage. No reason to have an angel have a baby because God makes angels for one purpose and that is to serve him and to do his bidding. They hearken unto his voice. They, they are flames of fire. He can make as many as he wants. But they are not redeemable. So Nephal, Nephilim is used there. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. The fallen ones were on the earth in those days. And, conjunction, the sons of God, a whole nother thing. And the sons of God went into the daughters of men. 
There's three things. There's three parties here. Read it. King James, Hebrew, homebrew, any kind of brew you want. You read it, and it'll say there's three different things happening here. Angels cannot procreate. They don't have the proper parts. God made man and womb man to start a family. Angels are servants. They're of a different species who don't procreate. Do not write me. Do not waste digital ink. <laughs> so there comes a time where all of these fallen people, the sons of when you look at Canaan, it's a clue. And you look what happened at the ark. And you look what happened after the ark. And after that, they were there again. And they popped up again. And then David had to take out all the giants. You have the sons of God that lived six to 900 years across the timeline at the top to the time of Noah. And then you have all these ishes, common man, that were having genealogies going down this way, this way. It got to the place where these could not touch these. Because genetics there and genetics here cause six fingers, six toes, if you look at genetic defects in the, in, in, gene, in the code, you'll see certain things come up in the genes, in the recessive. The way it works is you'll start to see six toes. And I can name the actors and actresses that you know that have had their sixth toe removed and their sixth finger removed. I can name them. There's 34 of them. Look it up on the internet. It must be true. <laughs> no. Okay, because Og and some of these, these, these giants, they had six toes, six fingers, and they were huge. That's because you have the godly line of Seth up here and all this shenanigans down here going this way. And it got to where they looked at the daughters of men and desired them and took them. The word there is kidnap. They became, this, this, is, this is where what, what went wrong. Not only that, don't even get me started on the animals because all of Greek mythology, you'll find out when you get to heaven, you'll find out all that junk really happened with half man, half animal. Why do you think the animals were destroyed? Why was there only a certain amount that came? They came. Did I mention came to the ark on their own? We're on the ark. No dinosaurs. And we're going to get into this because dinosaur is two words. Look it up. Just like mortgage. Two words. Death, grip. Mort, ga gauge. Death, grip. Dinosaur is Dine, terrible. Saurus is lizard. Terrible lizard. Check it out. Terrible lizard. Okay, so that's good. So you have the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. The whole thing about the genealogies that are in the Bible, which you can tell how long we've been in existence. It's not millions of years. I mean, the earth might be that old, but mankind, you can do it with the genealogies. That's why they're there. If you add it up and you look, there was never a place where one of those people that had interbred got into the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Oh, come on now. Let's be mature. If a lamb had a spot on it, it was rejected from sacrifice. Why? It was a genetic defect, and it could not be accepted. The sign was a visible defect. 
genetic flaw. Everybody follow me. So a spotless lamb was accepted. So Jesus was the spotless lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. But we had genealogies because God knew that Satan was going to nail that Messiah when he came. He wanted to infiltrate the bloodline of human beings so that we could never have a redeemer in a human body that was purely human. Is everybody follow me? Jesus came back to die for a human being, not for a hybrid, not for a giant, not for an alien. He's not going to go to another planet and die for an alien. We are only the ones in all of existence that are in the image of God. Jesus came as a man, a perfect sacrifice, perfect in his generations. If you look, Mary, it was perfect. If you look at all the genealogies, it skipped all the giant races. So that Satan's plan was, I got you. After the, after the crucifixion, he was going to God and say, gotcha. I got in the, the bloodline back here. He's not fully human. So why do you think they're after your DNA right now? Why do you think they're trying to alter? It's, it's because that has been the case since Genesis chapter 3. Come on now, you're all looking at me like, no, no, this is, it's, it's a three-year-old, a, th a third grader, not a three-year-old, but a third grader. They understand this, you know, the square, the square uh, peg doesn't fit into the round hole. Okay, it's, it's that simple. Angels don't do these things. This is, this is the godly line coming in and crossing over. Now, Nephilim, the fallen ones, there was a group of angels that left their abode. Peter talks about it. They're the fallen ones, the Nephilim. They are in chains right now. Peter says it, so forget about it. Forget about it. The fallen angels are in chains. Those who left their abode are in chains. Just read Jude. Read Peter. Read your Bible. <laughs> okay? There's millions of demons because each one of us, if you sit and listen to all of us talk about how big the devil is, that we got at least a couple million on, just on each of us. But, you know, dear Lord, the stuff we're going through. So how could a couple hundred angels that left their abode, which the book of Enoch talks about, the couple hundred that came down on Mount Hermon, they're the fallen ones, the Nephilim. This is it. I'm giving you one more chance. You got cherubim. You got seraphim. You got teraphim, mentioned in the Bible. And you got Nephilim. Any questions? Drive through to the next window, please. <laughs> now think about it. These, these were the fallen angels, Nephilim. They are not the hybrid race. The giants, Goliath was not a Nephilim. It says that the Nephilim came down in those days, and the wording is they influenced man to sin. They left their abode and made man leave their abode. And they did what was improper. Whew, man, get the car ready. I can just tell you. It's like, <laughs> no, no, listen to me. Can it be, listen, can it be this hard, really? Does it have to be hard? Don't make it something it's not. Right. Angels don't want to have intercourse. They don't even know what you're talking about. They just stare at you. Like, when I was in heaven, I was not, I had not even been married yet. I didn't care if I ever kissed a girl. I was standing in the throne room with the righteous men, spirits that had been made perfect. I was on Mount Zion. I was standing on the sapphire stone. I don't care about kissing a girl. I could care less about anything except who is seated on the throne. I didn't think about my parents. 
I didn't think about nothing. I didn't think about my school bill. I was kind of glad I got out of that. No, I'm going to have to pay that now. No. See what I'm saying? You're not attached to any of that anymore. You're like the angels in heaven. I could care less. There was no, neither male nor female up there. Did you hear what I just said? I, maybe I just didn't say it loud enough. There's neither male nor female in Christ. We are all equal. We are spirits of righteous men made perfect on Mount Zion. We're all sons. I go over, well, do not write me. Listen. That's just down here. There's a lot of stuff down here that you leave down here, and you'll be glad for it. You don't need, you don't need, you don't need to rent some space to store stuff <laughs> in heaven. You just leave it. You don't need it. There's so much you leave that, you, that is your soulish life. Okay, so the fallen ones came down, influenced men, the sons of God, to go into the daughters of men, sons of Adam into Ish. God repents that he even made man. It says, I'm going to destroy everything. There were only eight, it says, that were perfect in their generations. Were there as genealogies or genetics, period. They had not been infiltrated in their genetics. So they were the pure stock that would be in the ark that would go over the water to the other side and reseed the earth. The same covenant that he spoke to Adam, go forth and multiply and take dominion over everything. He said to Noah, Noah, he said the exact same thing to Noah, go forth and multiply and take dominion, dominion. It's not a machine. <laughs> you take dominion over everything. That's what he told Noah. So that's what he did. Noah did it, but then they popped up again. And so now in the cave of Adullam, justice comes, and David is told in Psalms 89, he said, there will never be a time where there is not someone sitting on your throne. Psalms 89, now, now think about this. When people were lined up on the streets and Jesus was walking by, what did they cry out? Son of David, have mercy on me. And they would be healed. Why? Because they recognized the genealogy of the promise. That's why his blood is so precious. That's why his blood forgives sins and heals the sick. His blood cleanses it. It completely washes it away. Oh, I forgot that I have to close. My God. Okay, so you have hibernization coming from the fallen ones, the Nephilim instituting the idea of teaching man how to sin. And then, because they got to, the fallen ones got to get them to do it because they're in a body. Okay, so they get man to sin and they think now we got him. The seed now is interbred into humanity and we got him. So God says, not so fast. I went ahead when I created the earth. If you check it out in chapter 1 of Genesis, he actually put water for no reason under the earth, and it didn't even rain. He had the water hidden underneath, and he had water above the terra firma, and he had it below it. And he had that planned because he knew what was going to happen, and he said, guess what? And he pushes a button, and the earth floods, and it rains for the first time. And the earth floods and destroys everything. Why? Because God put that water when he created the earth because he already knew that man would fall. Right. Amen. Jesus was slain from the foundations of the world. That's pretty early. Absolutely. Before the foundations of the world, before we needed a savior, he provided one. He already planned the water to come up. He destroyed the hybrid race. Okay. But the problem is, is that these are spiritual beings. But now they don't have a body. 
Okay, so what happens is, they don't want me to tell you this, that's why I'm telling you. If you'll be gracious enough to let me keep talking for another 30 minutes, if you'll be gracious and if you have to go, you have to go. But, you know, I didn't come here, I didn't come here just to hang out. Because we're, we're, we're way past, it's time to fly. It's time to just leave the runway and, and get in the air. And we got to have tools and understanding of what's going on be, around us. And people do not understand what's going on around us. Okay, so these people lost their bodies in the flood. Okay, so they're still where they were. The angels that fell are chained in Tartarus. These disembodied spirits, there was no problem because they were hidden until Jesus shows up and he goes, what do you have to do with us, son of God? Have you come to torment us before time? Don't send us out of the area. See, they were right where they were before the flood in a parallel world without a body and there is no redemption. There is no resurrection for them because Jesus didn't redeem them. He redeemed fully human beings. And obviously, according to Scripture, I have not crossed the Scriptures in any way. Obviously, if they were qualified, they would have been on the ark. But they weren't perfect in their generations, right? Have I said anything wrong? Perfect in their generations, only eight on the boat. Everyone's wiped out. They're disembodied spirits. That's why they seek embodiment because they seek expression, because they cannot do a thing to a human being and unless they are, have access. So they, they prey on the weakness of fallen man by beating them up, killing, stealing, and destroying, beating them into submission, making them think that they're not in God's image. And so they never come to the, the, to the, the place where they get saved because they're not good enough. But the price has been paid to redeem everyone. Okay, so we're all redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, but people go to hell. This is a travesty. Because Paul said that we have a ministry of reconciliation to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 5, he said, we have a ministry of reconciliation. We're supposed to go out and compel people to come in to announce that their sins have been forgiven. That's what it says. They're already forgiven. So no one should go to hell. But you have to acknowledge with believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the way, then you shall be saved. It, you have to acknowledge the way that God provided for that redemption, which is just us announcing the good news. Come on now. But the blood, it was the blood. The demons would scream. When I would cast them out, they would tell me. It was the blood that defeated us. They would, they would, they would tell me. Don't talk about the blood. It destroyed our works. It, it, it destroyed us. Don't mention the blood. Okay, well, what about the name of Jesus? Oh, that's a very powerful name. Don't mention that name. Very powerful. That's what they say. Very powerful. <laughs> like, thanks for letting me know. Yeah. Man, I didn't even have to give them a Scooby snack or anything. It is like start. Well, because this is what they did to Jesus. As soon as he got on the scene... All of a sudden, we had all these demons, but they were always there, but no one, no one had jerked their chain like Jesus did. Come on. And all of a sudden, they don't want to leave the area they're in. They don't want to be tormented before their time, so that means they are going to be tormented, and they don't want to leave their area because that's what they work a matrix in their area to keep people in bondage because it's genealogies. Why do you think you deal with the same thing your parents did? Because you have to break that devil. Yes, good. He's assigned to stop you. Oh, come on. Everybody's like, this is good. This is good. Okay, so you have the, the fallen ones, and then you have which are, are uh, the, responsible for teaching men how to sin and causing the hybrid race, which was destroyed by the flood, but it snuck through. And that is very interesting because it did sneak through. And I know, I know that it's just not time to talk about that, but it appeared on the other side. And then 
David was risen up to take out the giant race. And where did the Messiah, where, where did he come from? David. So you have Goliath was from Gath. So when David took his head off, it's, it clearly shows that he went to Jerusalem with the head. So he takes Goliath's head from Gath. And then Jesus is crucified on Golgotha. Goliath Gath? Yes. And I guarantee you, the head of that, that skull was right under where that cross was. Mm. I guarantee it. I guarantee you where he was crucified was where David planted the skull of Goliath. And you think your life's random. Okay. That's a good enough introduction. We should go home and then start tomorrow. But I haven't even got the familiar spirits. See, the familiar spirits, see, they don't want you to know. A person who decides that they want to traffic devils, which is forbidden by the scriptures as far back as the law, and a person who was given over to necromancy and witchcraft and the occult was to be put to death. There was no redemption for them. Why? Deliverance was not available. So they were put to death in the Old Testament. They had been defiled and there was no deliverance. But see, God's righteousness and justice was demonstrated through Jesus Christ. And now we have deliverance. Just like the devils wouldn't even say a word until Jesus came on the scene. That's just all those millions of disembodied spirits are, are just ruling and reigning all around the people. David, it says that Satan tempted him to count the fighting men. First time it's mentioned. God said, don't count. Your strength, your, 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 your strength is in the arm of the Lord, not in your armies. You don't boast in your strength. And so counting your men is like sitting and counting your money. Just like a wind can come and blow all that money away at the picnic table you're counting it on. Your army could be wiped out. So you're, you're, you don't trust in horses and chariots and armies. You trust in the Lord, okay? Your help comes from the Lord, okay? So Satan tempted David to count his fighting men and sinned. He sinned. Okay, so that is like one time where you see, is that a bug? That thing, that thing must... That thing eats better than I do. My God, that thing is huge. Is that a dinosaur? He's like going around like, hey, you got any snacks? He's like walking around like. Okay, so familiar spirits. They, if they can gain access to a person who will traffic and operate in that realm, they will tell them. So if you go to a witch and they sit there and they read you, what they're really doing is they're waiting for the spirit. You get a spirit. You can read this in Webster's Dictionary. You don't, I can give you all the, I have it all on my laptop. I've already done the studies for this weekend. But if you just look it up, Operating in this, according to the dictionary, is when you get a spirit that becomes a pseudo or a part of your personality. So there's two of you is what it says in the dictionary. There's two yous, familiar. Two, you become two, is what the meaning of it is. You're not to operate in familiar spirits. 
Okay, so a spirit, one of these disembodied spirits, who has worked himself up in the ranks and has others under him, he will find someone who wants to be involved in witchcraft, like John Ramirez, when he was younger. And they, they flatter them and take them and give them more and more and more power. And what they have is they have a human being who is rightfully on the earth, has a belly button, came through a womb, belly button, legally here, and you have a illegal spirit who is disembodied, who has no right or authority to the earth, has to hijack a human being in order to operate and has to get a body to hijack in order to manifest. So it, it works in the soul realm. So they get into leadership above you to control you. But they work in a cloak way in their soul. They become part of the person. There's two of you. So a witch or a warlock meshes with a spirit and so the will of the spirit is now the will of a human being who has a mouth, has a will, and has authority as a human being. Has expression and can manifest anything in this realm that that spirit wants them to. Well, what was the reason for the hybrid race? It was sexual misconduct. So what is prevalent today? It's the spirits that were disembodied because of that sin that are influencing everyone in some way. Why is it so prevalent? Why is there so much confusion? Why? Why is there confusion? You don't know who you are? You don't know what you are? Well, God defines that. Right? Okay, if he made it man and woman, then that's the way it is. Okay? Now, anything else is because of a fallen world or something else, but it doesn't make God change who he is and what he did at the beginning just because things are broken and go a certain way. Okay, so the witch is told by the spirit. I, I, I've seen this happen. I watched the witches operate, and the spirit comes up right beside them and says, okay, their mother's name is Sally. Her, her sister died two years ago because I killed him in a car wreck. The spirit knows because they're the ones that did it. And Tell them that. So the person's like, oh my God, how'd you know that? It's a familiar spirit. They've been following you. And in a flash, that spirit will say, find out what their mother's name is. And a spirit will go like that and come right back like that. At the speed of light, at the, at the speed of light, you can go around the earth eight times in a second. An angel could go around the world eight times in a second. When the sun goes out in the middle of the day, it, it just goes poof, done, I'm done. I'm done with my atomic fusion. I'm not going to light up anymore. It takes over eight minutes for us to know that it went out. That's how far away it is at 186,000 miles a second. Light is traveling 186,000 miles a second. It still takes eight minutes for us to know that the, the sun just went out. So an evil spirit can go and find out information. And because this person, whoever it is, not Pastor Mike, because he would be working for me if he was. But a person is able to hear. That's why they call it peeps. They say they peep. Or incantations, it's all those words are used. I just don't want to pull out all those scriptures. There's, there's like 18 of them. They, those who peep, peep, look, peer into, look. So this is the hook. This is the hook. And this is where it gets into the prophets in the body of Christ. It says in a year, you're, you're, 
you're, uh, you're going to be dead. What? Ain't going to happen to me. So the witch says, in a year, you're going to be dead. Or they say, your brother, name them, will die next year, and then you'll be a year later. I've, I've, this is not, I'm not making this up. This is already, these are people I know who have had, had this happen. Okay, if that person who has just been amazed that they knew all that information, it, then they're like, okay, whatever. Then their brother dies a year later. Well, then they're next. Did you get what I just said? But they're not next. So if your parents died of something, do you have to die of it? Okay, do you get it? But we need to know your history of your family because if you're predisposed to this, we need to go ahead and start cutting things off your body now because you're going you're to get cancer anyway. I, I have friends that did that. I go, what did you just do? They go, well, I'm predisposed, so I'm just going to have it done now. Like, you just lost a body part because you're predisposed to what? A Christian. A Christian. Because a movie star had that happen to her. Had something removed from her chest. Her chest. Had her chest removed. So she went and got her chest removed because she found that there was something in her gene. This is someone I know, a Christian. Well, it's predisposed, so it's probably going to happen, so I'd rather just have that removed now. Are you going to have your chest removed because you might... Just stop eating Captain Crunch or something, you know. In other words, just don't, just start seeking God and don't, don't, just don't do the things that you need. I'm trying to tell you something here. These devils do not want you to know none of this. And I told my, I called Ryan, I called Ryan, I said, I'm spilling all the beans tonight. I'm going to spill all the beans all the weekend. I've had it. You, you all, you all, you all think, you all think, well, my angels are watching over me. Right? Okay. Well, then why do things still seep through? Because they don't come to fail. I believe that we are to work with God. And he works with us. It says that in Acts that the the apostles, they preached the word and God worked with them worked with them performing signs and wonders, confirming the word that they spoke. There was a, so I'm not going to be led into temptation. I'm going to be delivered from evil. To quote a famous person like Jesus, that's what he said, to pray. <laughs> Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the glory and the power forever. Amen. Amen. Thy kingdom come on the earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. And this is where we find ourselves in the situation. This is why. This is why we are in the situation we are. Because we have been waiting for God to do something that he has already told us to do. And it's a remnant. We should have a stadium full of people. We, we have a, a thousand. 1,300 sign up thousand show up, that's fine. But what about everybody else that needs to know that there is a world, you, you believe your angels are with you, well then, why is there failure? Why is there still things that seep through? Why do we get sick? Why do, why do we have trouble making money when people cheat and make more money and they live, they live to have 47 years in Congress? <laughs> They live forever. It is mathematically impossible. When you, I have friends that were intercessors that prayed, that fasted, and they died in car crashes in their 30s. Mm-hmm. They were men and women of God that just fought. They fought for me. They prayed for me when I was a flight attendant. And they, a driver hit them and killed them. Okay, but yet we got people that keep living in evil and doing evil and and nobody stops them. Nothing. Now listen to me. 
Isn't that enough what I just said to show you that if angels are present and yet these demons are still able to operate, that maybe it is you that has been given the authority and not them. Because you have a belly button. You are a human being. Is everybody following me? Okay. So you have the Nephilim, you have the hybrids, and then you have familiar spirits. The familiar spirits will tell you what they're going to do, but it'll appear that it's prophetic. And if you believe it, then they have legal right. They have legal right because you're in agreement with it. And if you pay money, then you really sealed the deal. That's why they ask for a donation. They read your palms. It's like, you know what? I got highways on my palms. Here's going in the Canaan land, and then this one is going to the throne room, and then this one is my next miracle. It's like, oh, no, see how that, I mean, I'm serious. I grabbed my hand. I didn't even ask. So I grabbed my hand. Okay, oh, that, that's short. That means you're, you got maybe 10 years, 11. I'm serious. Like, actually, I cut myself with a knife when I was 11, and that's why that's it. It's not. <laughs> this is man-made. That wasn't. Dear Lord. Okay. All right. So we are supposed to know what our Father's doing and do that. Jesus said at 11, you know, I was about my father's business, mother. Actually, he started calling her woman. That's when you know something's going on. Woman. It's not my time yet, woman. He did. He, said, he didn't say mom. He said, it's not my time yet, woman. And she had an attitude. Because on the way out, she whispered to the guys, whatever he tells you to do, do it. No pressure. Okay, so evil spirits, like right now, they are waiting for you on your way out to talk you out of everything that the Word of God has just shown to you. They, they want to steal the Word like blackbirds. Just take the seed as you're sowing. Just be right behind you coming and taking it. Why? Because they don't want you to have a harvest. They don't want you to have a harvest of the Word of God in your life. So they come immediately, Jesus said, after the sower sows the word, they come immediately to steal that word. Why? Because it is really hard to get rid of an orchard. But it's not hard to get rid of a plant. It's so quick. You got to remember, it's not 30, 60, 100 percent. It's it's fold. That's exponential. So you keep multiplying what you get to the, to the nth power. So at, at, seven, at, n, at n to the 17th power, it is absurd and incalculable. And yet it is n to the 87th power to actually do an experiment where a puddle on the earth produces a human being. A human genome out of a puddle. There's not enough. There's not enough matter, time to do the experiment. End to the 87th. And yet, end to the 17th power, which is multiplied by multiplied. You keep multiplying the number by the number. Seven after 17th power, it's absurd. This is from the mouths of scientists, but yet they said, oh, look, a human being popped out of a puddle. <laughs> Do you know that half of the amino acids that form the genetic codes, you have amino acids that are actually, is this too much? Because I can... But they, you, they actually, you know, if you look, you got alanine and you got all these different 
amino acids that attach themselves and form the genome. I mean, the mosquito, I have the mosquito genome, and it is like 15 feet long. Just a mosquito. Okay, but half of the amino acids are toxic, like L-strychnine. So random experiment, as soon as you get maybe N to the 76th power, and you get L-strychnine in the genetic code, it destroys the whole strand, and you have to start all over again. 50-50 chance of it turning out wrong and a failure every time you do the experiment, every single time, and yet you've got to do this for years. There's not enough matter in the known universe to take all that matter, put it into a puddle, and see what happens. And, and any, anybody that's, that would be honest knows all this, because Flight Ted of Praise and Tongues knows it. So what do you think they know they can fix my knee right now. But they can't keep me from the flu. They can, they can fix my knee right now, but they don't. They can fix diabetes right now. Israel already has. I'm asking you something. Do you really understand what's going on around you? Because it's all about the deception of getting a human being to believe something that's not true and siding with it and then becoming a worker bee for iniquity. Well, I'm just not gonna work for the devil. He works for me, I don't work for him. He's defeated, okay? All right. Jeez, I broke a record. Okay. Jesus said, that you shall trample on serpents and scorpions and have power. The word there is authority over all the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. It's exactly what's in Hebrew in Psalms 91. He is quoting Psalms 91, which means if he can quote it, I can quote it. That's right, amen. If he can believe it, then I can believe it. He ties the Old Testament scripture of Psalms 91 to my insurance policy in the New Testament. Don't be mad at me, Jesus did it. He, he brought the Old Testament into the New Testament, so now it's mine. It was mine anyway, but you know how people are territorial about that little thin page between the new and the old, <laughs> that blank page. It's just, just enough to blow your nose, you know. It's just tissue paper. It's not, the same God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. At what point are you going to be upset enough to stand up and trample on That's serpents right, and scorpions? That's right, I so, this is what I do. If, if I'm going to take, if, if he gives me one verse, when he, when he quotes in the New Testament, one verse of Psalms 91, well, you know what? I'm just going to take the whole chapter, if you don't mind. That's right. Okay, well, it says that nothing shall come near you and to harm you yeah. Yeah. that a thousand will fall at my right hand and ten thousand or a, a thousand shall fall ten thousand at my right hand but it shall not come near you yeah. well I want the whole package yeah. just just wrap it up I'll take the whole thing yeah. the whole cow the whole cow I'll just take the whole thing I just don't want a t-bone I'll take it all okay well this is what you have to do it's just a smaller group of people that we have now. But we have 20,000 students. Of, as of two th Fridays ago, we broke 20,000 students. Yeah. Hallelujah. We just started the school two years ago. Yeah. Not, how long has it been now? No, it's been two and a half, right? Two, oh, it's the churches, 1,200 churches in nine months. Okay, so... There are people out there that are done. Yes. And isn't it time to just know the truth and let it just fall where it does? But you've got to be careful that you're not hoodwinked, right. bamboozled, or whatever you want to say, <laughs> by the devil into thinking that what I have just told you isn't true. Because I just laid the scripture out for you, and we went through it at lightning speed. 
These disembodied spirits, they cannot win and they hate you and That's they right. are not going to give an inch unless you make them. That's right, amen. So it's time for a recall. That's right, amen. You know, it's time to just say, you know what, devil? I think you have had power long enough. That's right, amen. Because it's all, it's all, it's all in the Bible that Jesus defeated you. And he right. said he's made a show of them openly, but it says he's destroyed, destroyed the works of the devil. And, and it, isn't it true? I mean, it's in John. I checked. It's still there. Even, even the nearly inspired version, the NIV, has not taken it out yet. It says that to those who, who believed on him, he gave them the authority, the power to become sons of God. What is all creation groaning for? That the sons of God would be revealed. That's what it says in Romans. All creation is groaning because they fell with us. Okay, so we could do some music now, just a little bit. The drive through windows are closing, though, but they, they, I think they can. Listen, what these evil spirits, what they, what they, what they hope is, is that you do nothing. They are holding on for dear life. We are the authority on the earth. Listen, in the time of Jesus, religion didn't, didn't do it. He called them a brood of vipers. Let's, get, let's just teach people about relationship with God. Let's teach people about the love of God, about the goodness of God leads people to repentance, about that, that God has good news and a good, he's a good God and he's not doing all these terrible things. And that, you know what? Whether I'm well or sick, I'm still believing whether I'm rich or poor, I still believe. I'm not going to change what I believe. When I was poor, I believed. When I'm rich, I believe. When I was sick, I believe. When I, I'm well, I believe. When I'm in jail, I believe. When I'm free, I, I believe. It doesn't matter. What matters is the eternal value that was placed in us from the beginning. If any of you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, come up here and I'll pray for you. We're just going to worship a little bit. We are starting at 9 in the morning. We will start worshiping at quarter till 9. And we will, we will begin, and we're going to have a kids uh, session before lunch as well. We're going to minister to the kids and you'll get to see that. And then in the afternoon, the kids will, will get their training in the simulator. And then we'll have our afternoon session as well that will start in the afternoon around 2.30. But... You will wake up tomorrow morning with the same power that you feel here. It will not dissipate. This is permanent. You all have been chosen. I just heard, I heard, I heard an evil spirit. I just heard an evil spirit say, we're done. They said, we're done. I just heard, we're done. Hallelujah. See, because Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. You know, I even, I even called him. I called John Ramirez. I said, can you come to Dalton? Can you come next week to Dalton? He goes, I can't. I said, I said, you can come anytime you want and minister with me. He's a warlock, and he's a born-again, spirit-filled Christian. He, he said, Kevin, he said, if I was a warlock in New York still, and I saw you on the street, I would run the other way. That's what he told me. He says, because I can tell you, you know it, you believe it. He said, he said, what you know, I learned from Satan himself. And you learned it from God. You learned it by going to heaven. He said, I went to hell and learned this. I learned, I learned how to deal with the devil from the devil himself. I said, I have never met him. <laughs> I met Jesus. I feel maturity in this room. Let's, let's just stand. And I want, to, I want you to confess this with me. And thank you for being so patient. This teaching tonight is so important to me. So important to God. Now, this is what the Spirit of God is saying loud and clear in my ears. And I want you to repeat what the Spirit is saying over you. In this room right now, I hear Him louder than anything else right now. He's saying, your value 
was determined long ago in heaven. Do not let anyone diminish that. That's what the Spirit is saying. I'm prophesying to you. That's what the Spirit said. He said, you tell them their value was determined in heaven long ago. Do not let anyone or anything diminish that value while you're here. I stand, I stand in the presence of God and I'm telling you, I'm telling you to live and not die. I'm telling you to prosper. I'm telling you to prosper and not wither up. I'm commanding the earmarked provision to come to you that was already provided for you, that the devil has held back from you. I command it to come to you now. I command healing to come to your body. I command all your crazy family members that are freaking out right now to, to, to get with it. I command, I command every child, every child, every child that has ran away that you're waiting for them to come home. I am commanding right now the angels to go retrieve them because it shall be you and your household shall be saved. You and your household shall be saved. That's what was told to the jailer. When the angel came and opened all the doors, he was going to fall on his sword. He said, you and your household shall be saved. Father, the anointing is here, the Holy Spirit, and the, and the power to heal is here. So we just raise our hands and we receive supernatural healing right now in our bodies. We speak life. I speak life to your lungs. I speak life to your blood. I speak life to your legs and to your organs, to your mind. I speak in life. I command you to live and not die. Healing is coming through this room right now in the name of Jesus. Every knee is going to bow someday and, and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the way. If you don't know him, get up here right now and give your life to him. I break witchcraft over everyone in the name of Jesus. Every, every lying devil, I break your power by the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. And I stand firm on all the will of God and all the word of God over everybody's life. And I prophesy fire from the holy altar. Fire, fire. fire right now in the name of Jesus. Fire. Fire. And the Lord, he wants to whisper your future to you. He wants to whisper. As he walks with you, he wants to whisper your future to you. He wants to tell you the plans he has for you, good plans, an expected end, plans for you to prosper, an expected end. The Lord loves you. Hallelujah. Oh my God, the glory of the Lord is here. Lord, Lord, do what you've never done before, Lord. Do something you've never done before. Reach out and heal the whole place, Lord. Everyone heal. Everyone. Deliverance has come. Deliverance has come. Deliverance has come. I'm done with you, devil. No, say it. Your power is broken by the name of Jesus.
of you can do this. Any one of you can. I'm just setting an example, and then one day I'll just disappear. And you all do this. Doing this as a favor for the Lord. I'm telling you, you're all supposed to be doing this. Wherever you tread your foot is yours. Come on now, your spirits are lit up. Let's sing. Let's sing in the spirit. Come on.